Hi, I'd like to uh, ask you to do something for me, if you wouldn't mind. If you like this episode, I'd like you to not only subscribe on your favorite site, but I'd also like you to give a rating. Ideally, a, a five-star rating would be you know, greatly appreciated. But I think more importantly also would be just uh, some uh, comments. That helps with the algorithm and it helps build the, uh, the audience with this. And more than anything else, if you could invite somebody else to listen, just share this episode with a friend, with a colleague, and uh, I'd like to see how we can grow the soul of business. I think it makes a difference. Thanks. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. Um, you know, I was uh, out walking um, yesterday, uh, and I live on an island uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I've got 11 acres to walk on, so there's a lot of room to move. And what's interesting, particularly in the fall time, um, when I'm walking, I'm just, you know, it's about taking, uh, you know, a word for this is an awe bath, A-W-E, an awe bath. Uh, just, you know, wander through nature and just be struck by, you know, with, with, you know, literally struck with awe at the beauty and the, in the, in the, uh, the, the differences, the diversity that I run into. Um, you know, ranging from lichens on the tree to the deer path that are going through. But none of it would be possible in the grand beauty that it actually presents itself as without diversity. If it was just a one size fits all sort of a thing, it would be an, you know, an immensely boring, uh, <laughs> walk over time. You know, think of just, you know, tracing through a Sahara desert sand where there's no, you know, no, 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 no diversity. It's just sand. Um, and I mention this because when we start thinking about, uh, the way organizations thrive, the way life is, is, uh, designed to thrive, one of the absolute, ins uh, essential ingredients is diversity and how that diversity gets included into the greater uh, weaving of the tapestry, I think, is a real interesting conversation to have. And that is kind of my preamble to introducing my guest today, Dr. Joel Davis-Brown. Um, Joel's um, the chief visionary officer of an organization called Numos LLC, which is a management consulting firm and, and coaching firm. They're based in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco, but also have offices in Nairobi. Uh, but what's very interesting here is that they specialize in global diversity and inclusion, you know, from a leadership perspective, from a change management perspective, and from a success perspective. And you know, the list of uh, clients with whom he's worked and who the firm has worked with is, is pretty diverse uh, in and of itself. And they are well-known names that I'm not necessarily going to go into uh, detail with. But in just in terms of background, yeah, he's got a you know, JD degree. Uh, uh, so he's a, a, a lawyer you know, by education, but he's also a uh, liberal arts. Uh, and I say liberal arts in the sense that, uh, you know, he's got, a, I believe it's a master's. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I got my, uh, I got my BA um, in, Philosophy and political science. Philosophy and political science. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. yeah. I, I, my brain went dead here. I'll so, you know, when you talk about a diverse educational background, you know, you know, the, the richness that that kind of a background brings into play here, I think, is going to be a very uh, telling piece of how we actually conduct this uh, conversation. And I'm purposely not calling it an interview because I want to just wrap here. I want to find out just kind of how all this comes together. So, Love Joel, it. welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward. I love the terminology. Let's wrap. Let's have a conversation and dialogue. So uh, I'm all for it. Thank you for having me. How did, how did you, I mean, just, I mean, we're going to take this DEI in nature here and I want to eventually you know, move it into a conversation around business specifically, but just as a general uh, overview, how did this get a hold of you? That's a really great question. How did it get a hold of me? Um, from lived experience, uh, from working in organizations and seeing not only my own, other uh, people's experiences, but my own experience where you have ideas, you have talent, you have um, insight. And to see that being wasted, dismissed, overlooked, or neglected simply because you didn't have a certain profile. So, what I started to think about is, 
not only how do I create an environment for myself, but more importantly, how do I make sure that other people don't have the similar or same experiences that I have? So that's where the interest came. And when you talk about the tapestry and the diversity of the people in the workforce, we all have different ways of doing things. And I know that sometimes you talk to business leaders and I talk to quite a few daily, uh, and I am a business leader, that there's this perception that there's a universal way of doing things and that that universal way of doing things is the only way that things are done, right? And yeah. that's just not true. So when we think about what it means to be professional, what it means to be a leader, um, even in what may seem like a homogenous environment, there are many different ways that people can lead and inspire and motivate people to be their best and to be the best themselves. So what we want to do, and what I wanted to do was to figure out, well, how can we tap into that? And um, that became my calling. Um, I realized at a very, very early in my career that I wasn't built just to sit behind a desk and to peck on the keyboard and look at the screen. Mm -hmm. And I started to think more broadly of if people are spending, you know, Americans like love to work and we spend 10 hours a day, at least in the workplace. That's a long time not to be honored. That's a long time not to be affirmed and validated. So what can we do to change that so that people don't spend you know, half of their day, um, however many, whatever percentage of their existence, not feeling seen, heard or respected? Because that's a lot of yeah. time and that's a lot of energy. So that's what inspired me to do so. And then to think more broadly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that last um, uh, con you know, piece there that you were just you know, talking about. I, you know, real early on in my career, I, I got just fascinated by the fact that most people seemed to be dispirited when they were at work. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and in my 20s, I got curious about, you know, what's that about? Because they seemed to be alive when they weren't at work, but then they seemed to right. be you know, zombified when they, got, when they actually got to work. And mm -hmm. this whole notion of being seen and heard uh, started, you know, that wasn't the language I used at that point in time, but that's essentially what was going on here. Seen, heard, and valued for the unique individual that they are and that uniqueness, yeah, is it tapped into or not? And if I have the experience that I'm not being tapped into for who I am and what I can bring to the table, I get dispirited. And that's where the soul of business conversation came into play for me. Yeah. Um, from a leadership perspective, I, you know, if I've got an organization that's got, I mean, you know, real easy example here, real easy, quote, unquote, easy example. Amazon, I saw this uh, come across uh, one of my news feeds today, holiday season coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. As we're uh, conducting this right now, we're at the beginning of October. Um, but Amazon is planning on hiring 250,000 people for the holiday season. Wow. A quarter of a million people. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that through the lens of leadership and diversity and you know, yeah, inspiring, not necessarily motivating, but inspiring people to actually contribute in a way that's unique to who they are. That's an interesting conversation for these, you know, the managers at Amazon to have, I would assume. Yeah, how do we do this so it's not just a cookie cutter and it doesn't become robotic? Um, and I'm not suggesting that that is the way that it is, although I've got kind of a hunch that, you know, in some of these warehouses, <laughs> we may have some, you know, some semblance of that. Um, mm. But when when you talk about leadership you know, and i'm familiar enough with some of your work here that you know, you've got something that uh, you call the nine meta themes mm. um for the foundation of effective strong leadership how do yeah. these come into play if they come into play with a diverse workforce i think the um and this isn't directed towards you i, I think the mistake is sometimes with leaders we feel like we have to do something magically different when we're talking to people who are different than us. And mm -hmm. really what a lot of this work is about is reminding people that it's all about tapping into humanity and it's all about recognizing the connection that we all share. So it's, and a lot of my work is not about teaching people things that are rocket science, it's about helping them to unlearn a lot of the things that they've learned. So for example, it's about helping them to recognize that we are all interconnected. So when you see someone, let's say, who is um, Asian Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, um, someone who's a millennial, someone who, let's say, comes into the workforce and they have on tattoos and they have a, a certain persona and temperament, 
ultimately we all are trying to strive towards the same things. We want to be able to feel free. We want to be recognized and valued, and we want to um, be able to make an impact and contribution to the world and to the organization. The way we do that is different. And so what it requires a lot of times is not starting with or thinking, how do I reach the other person? It actually is counterintuitive. It requires us to first think about what do I need to deactivate within myself or what do I need to activate within myself so that I can let go of my biases and my assumptions about how we should do things, how work can be. Um, and that's about helping us to build self-awareness. That's about helping us to recognize, again, how we're all connected and how we're part of a community and to build relationship. You know, leadership is about building relationship. And that doesn't mean you're becoming best friends. And I know someone listening to this may say, so you're as actually asking me to build a relationship with or let's say a company like Amazon to build a relationship with a quarter of a million people. Well, that's what you do when you sell your product and you put yeah. out your service. You are building a relationship. Um, you know, companies such as Apple, for example, sell people on what they're going to benefit from or how they're going to benefit from having the device that I'm speaking to you on right now or how much easier their life is going to be. So there's a value proposition and there's the idea in that exchange that by giving you the service and the product, your life is going to be better. So that is a relationship. There is an expectation there. Right. And so when it comes to leadership, I think. What I love to see more organizations do is to give people the expectation or to allow people to have the expectation that when I come to work, I don't have to put myself on the shelf. I don't have to check myself. I don't have to put who I am into a drawer or to swallow myself from nine to five. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, that you bring your Friday night self or your Sunday morning self when you perhaps are um, out in the world and you're enjoying life and partying to the fullest. But it does mean that allowing people to be themselves also helps them to be their best self, which serves everybody. I don't know anyone who does their best work, who shows up when they are having to be small, when they have to shrink themselves or when they have to hide who they are. And I think for many people, um, particularly in leadership, I think they may take that for granted. Right. There are a number of leaders I've spoken to who don't recognize that, well, you get to be who you are. You don't even have to think about this. No mental tax when you're talking to people that they're going to take you seriously that you're going to be respected, that you're going to be valued, that you're going to be welcome, that you're going to be seen. But that's not the reality for a number of people. So there is, in a sense, this desire to overcome what I would say, you know, some of the negative aspects of what happens in work. But then I, what I also encourage clients to do is to go beyond that, go beyond, you know, this idea that we don't want to hurt people, but then say, well, what do we all gain when we learn from other people's perspective, particularly when those 250,000 Amazon workers are then engaging with, let's say, a million people in the world, there are going to be ways of being and ways of uh, performing that are going to be important to make sure that that transaction with Amazon is not the last transaction and that it becomes there's multiple transactions thereafter because people feel valued and esteemed in their relationship with Amazon. That's what's important. And you can't do that when you're asking people to be homogenous or to conform or to act in um, culturally monochromatic ways that don't recognize the beauty and the diversity, not only of the people within the organization, but people in the world and in the community as well. I love that answer. Um, you know, the idea of um, how do I feel about me when I'm in the presence of your service or product? I think that is a, a key question. It's one that I play with a lot with the clients with whom I work. Yeah, you know, yeah, and and I do a lot of work in the leadership space. How do how do the people that you know that are around you feel about themselves when you show up? Mm -hmm. Do they feel uplifted? Do they feel seen? Do they feel valued? Do they feel as if they can, or you know, fill in the blanks on the opposite side of that? Mm -hmm. That's the that's your charter as a leader is to uh, you know, curate that. Right. And if you're not consciously curating that as in an uplifting sort of a way, you're missing the mark in a huge number of uh, domains. Um, and one of the things that I've you know, discovered just you know, in the course of about 40 plus years of working with, with these clients, uh, those leaders that actually can identify or work with people such that they can identify what's that unique skill, talent, or knowledge that they can bring, that unique way of being that they can bring to the table that others on the team can actually begin to bounce off of and leverage. The, the, the whole becomes far greater than the elements that, you know, that comprise it. 
And that is, you know, if, if, if there's a secret sauce to effective leadership, that would seem to be it for me. It's being able to gel a team so that it's performing in ways that you would look at individual contributors and go, don't know how you got here. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Sort exactly. of a thing, but together I can I can see that we can we can, sort right. of a deal. So within the context, and I'm going to you know kind of bring it back to the DEI conversation here. Uh, there's been such politicis you know, politicization. You know, how do you say this? It's been so politicized, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, demonized um, that, and in a lot of the cases, it's it's just been kind of a facade that's been put up uh, almost in a greenwash sort of a way. Mm -hmm. um, so the companies can say, well, we did that. If we're really going to take a deep dive in it and leverage that from a leadership, transformational leadership perspective, how, how do we go about doing that you know, in a way that uh, keeps people engaged without blowing things up? I think, number one, we have to help people realize that being inclusive and being equitable and being diversity minded is not separate from leadership. I think that's the the, the first thing is people think that, oh, I become a leader and now I'm being asked to do something different. If you are running, managing, leading an organization group, and I, when I talk about leadership, I also say to people, leadership applies to your entire life. So your family, how you show up in your community, mm -hmm. um, and how you uh, conduct your business with the person you see in the mirror. If you're not able to see and recognize the humanity, the talent, the possibility, that and the potential that each person has, you're not being a leader. So it's not even about being transformational. You're just not being a leader really? to begin with. Yeah. I think the second thing that I try to impress upon um, a lot of leaders, particularly in this era right now, and in this um, climate where you know, DEI has become kind of this four-letter word, um, there's a lot of misinformation. And you know, DEIB does not mean that um, everybody's at the table. And I think that's part of the misinformation that's taking place. And so there are people who I've spoken to who said, well, I'm being told that somehow I'm not part of the equation. And what I say to them is, it's not that you're not part of the equation, it's that we're making room for others to actually be at the table. So you don't get to go away. In fact, you are still very much important, but now we're making room for others. And what we're asking you to do is to recognize the differences and helping people to understand what exactly that means, but then focusing on what I would say are tangible behaviors. Because I do think part of the challenge and part of the um, fault that many of us in the industry have made is we've talked about something in a very abstract um, way, but we haven't made it digestible. So for example, I'm working with a client now, pretty big name client in your neck of the woods. And one of the things that I, you know, I said to them is if we're going to talk about DEIB, we have to make it relevant to people's everyday work experience. So it can't, I said, so for example, there are a number of issues that are happening out there in the world, but then the question that a leader might ask is, well, I'm just making widgets. How does that, I'm hearing DIB applied, yeah. for example, in the, um, the social, the criminal justice context or in the housing context or in the educational context, all of which are important. How do I make this relevant to what I do? So then I said, well, let's talk about that. So, and I'll just give you one example or two examples. When you deliver feedback, how are you delivering your feedback? Are you even giving feedback to certain segments of your population? And are you doing it in a way where there's a clear request for development and growth? Is it actionable feedback? And we know from statistics, for example, that, if, for example, if you're looking at women, women oftentimes not only do not get feedback, are often harshly judged by feedback or are deemed not um, ready or receptive for feedback, which stunts their developmental growth. That is a very tangible way that we can think about DEIB in terms of leadership. Let's look at decision making. When you make decisions, are you being solicitous of all opinions? Are you making sure that your decisions are inclusive, even if you decide ultimately that this is the direction we're going to go in, which may be at odds with someone else's opinion of how you should conduct what you should do? Are you being transparent? Are you making sure that people are on board? Or is it kind of this uh, command and hierarchical culture where you just say, this is my decision. I've gone off on the vision quest into the desert, I've made this decision. So when you break it down that way, what happens are two, two things happen. One, people realize, oh, now I start to see how this stuff really matters. And number two, 
these are things that are important to me. So even if you don't, you don't identify, for example, as a member of a historically underrepresented group, who doesn't want to feel part of a decision-making process? Who doesn't want to get feedback in a way that allows them to be better? So then people start to understand that these concerns are not um, alien. They're not supernatural. These are real things that will help us all to perform better and to achieve our organizational mission. So that's really the key. And I think also recognizing that when people are bringing their expertise, how can you achieve your mission when you leave half of your team behind or you're mm -hmm. not allowing people who have ideas, but because, you know, they use a different pronoun that you would expect or because they um, they're LGBTQ, whatever the case might be, you're not recognizing their talent. That hurts all of us. And I think part of the challenge in the world right now, when we look at some of the critical issues that our country and our world are facing, we're in this position because we have not, again, opened up seats at the table to leverage all the wisdom that's out there. And that to me is scary because I think to myself, we probably could have figured out um, cures for disease. We might have been able to solve some of the issues related to climate change. Some of the um, wars that are taking place around the world might have been quelled if we simply took into account the wisdom, expertise, knowledge, and lived experience of all people. And that's what strikes me. So you talk about walking in, you know, where you live. And I remember going to places like Tulsa and this isn't to besmirch Tulsa or going to places like Memphis or just looking at our country and thinking, where would we be if we simply had are not dealing with these issues like, oh, you look different. Oh, yeah. you are disabled. That's what's frustrating to me. And that's what gives me even more passion to say, I don't want the next generation to have to deal with this because they won't have the luxury to because the issues are going to be even more critical and dire than what they are now. Absolutely. You know, I used to do, uh, well, I'm, I still do, but uh, one of the programs I used to uh, run years and years and years ago, um, you know, had to do with personal power and mm -hmm. uh, change in organizations. <clears throat> and one of the exercises I would you know, do pretty regularly was bring two people up to the front of the room, just have them sit there facing each other and then ask the audience, tell me what you see, tell me what you notice. Mm -hmm. And they would start describing, first of all, they would start, you know, they would start with similarities. Well, they're, they're two human beings, but it would quickly diverge to differences. Yeah. Yeah. That person's different in this way. That person's different in this way. And it struck me very simply that most pe the default for most people is to sort for differences. And then that othering begins to become an alienation. They're not right. like me. So because I've got no place to put them, uh, you know, as soon as I start to other and, you know, you know, say that's different than what I experienced for myself, by definition, it's moved outside of me and it's a them at that point in time. It's not an us. Right. And that conversational dynamic, and that's really where I would kind of key the whole program was the language we use both creates, but it also reflects reality. It reflects an internal reality that gets manifested externally but it also creates a reality that if we're not conscious of what's going on, we end up having stuff happen that is not going to be something that is going to be generative in the long term. It can actually be very uh, uh, punitive for the organization's ability to actually be effective you know, in the long run. Well, that's why it's important for leaders when they're talking about DEIB, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and want to have done their own work to understand why is this important. I can tell you, and I'm sure you've had this experience too, how many leaders I've had who've approached me and said, we want to do DEI work. And I say, my first question is always very simple. Why? Why? And I've had people get very frustrated, flustered, defensive. Well, it's just obvious. And I said, if you can't articulate it for me, and if you can't, if you're not clear, then this initiative agenda is going to sink. Why? Because you don't understand the business imperative the moral imperative and the humanistic imperative. And if you frame it in a way like what you just referred to, where it's seen as, oh, woe is me. We're just trying to um, follow the latest trend. We're trying to make sure we don't get sued. Why would anybody be on board with that? Why would that inspire people? So what I say to, and what I've talked to leaders about is you've got to be able to understand and talk about why this is a win, how everybody benefits, why there's joy in doing this work. And I don't use that term joy loosely. It's one of my core values, right. but this is also something that I say to leaders, you got to be able to figure out what's the positive aspect of this. Yeah. Doing this work brings people together. I mean, there's, there's tons of studies out there, whether it's the Aristotle project at Google, which is yeah. well-documented, 
There's many other studies out there. So I tell these, if you don't understand the metrics and the reason why diversity benefits business, it's not because there isn't evidence. It's not because there's research or there aren't facts. It's willful, willful ignorance to some extent. But the other um, thing I would say is when we're thinking about you know, why this work is important is because it helps us to work more synergistically. It helps us to develop the best solutions. It helps us to reach more people and it helps us to do our job in a much more effective way. That's ultimately what this work is about. And so to the extent that leaders have done their own work and they're able to articulate a clear vision and reason and message for why this is important, then I think you're setting your um, your leaders and your organization up for success. The problem is enough, too many people have not done their own work and there are plenty who have, but there are some leaders who are not doing their work and don't understand why this is important because of their own blocks and their own barriers and their mm-hmm. own biases around this work, thinking this doesn't apply to me. This is going to take away necessary, uh, unnecessary time. Uh, this is something that's going to be a drag on our finances and our profit margin. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is going to be demoralizing. And so when you sell it that way, I always say to people, <laughs> if I if I bring your let's, I don't know what your favorite meal is, but you know I'm big into soul food. So if someone brings me soul food and on a trash can lid, even though I love soul food, well of course I'm not going to eat it because of how it's been presented. So if you bring DEI on a trash can lid, people are going to want to throw it, keep it in the trash. But if you bring it on the silver platter, if you bring it in a way that's elegant and refined and compelling, then people are going to be more apt to at least be receptive. And not everybody's going to be receptive. But if you can at least get, I would say, a critical mass of people who are, then you can work with the middle, those that middle range of people who are skeptical and then Mm -hmm. you can get them to be converse. And then those people who are entrenched, you can eventually say, see what's happening, see the developments. This is where we're going. We want you to get on board and this is how it can benefit you. And that's how you're able to move the organization forward. And you have to give yourself and give the organization enough time for that to happen. This isn't going to be. These measures aren't designed to be things that take place over a month or a quarter. You have to have long-term investment and long-term commitment. Yeah, it's not a one-and-done, quick fix sort no, of a thing. Not at all. There's two pieces here that you know we're coming to a, a kind of a point where we need to begin to wrap. But I don't want to wrap without going into two areas here in specific. Here, one is a distinction between equity and equality. Yes, and if you could, you know, kind of paint a picture about why what what's the difference here because when we're looking at DEI we're really not talking about equality we're no. talking about equity in the in the in the workplace what's what does that you know, look like I'm so glad you brought you brought that up and asked that question so equality is guaranteeing an outcome and equity mm-hmm. is guaranteeing opportunity they're two different things and so the best yeah. way to describe it is to tell a very brief story from my days at the University of Minnesota I was a resident assistant and occasionally we had to run fire drills. What we realized, of course, is that when we rung the bell, you know, so everybody can hear this siren, that people who were uh, hearing impaired couldn't hear it. So we realized that we had to create a different system, flashing lights, so that all people were apprised of the potential danger. That's equity. Equity means taking into account a person's unique social circumstance to make sure that they have equal opportunity. It doesn't mean that you're saying that everybody has to, um, everybody's going to reach the same, um, the finish line at the same time. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to always succeed, but we do want to make sure that people have the opportunity. And the challenge, of course, with DEIB, well, what we see in the world is that we're asking people to compete when they don't have the same, they're not coming from the same starting line or they're not uh, coming from the same starting block. So equity work is designed to level the playing field to say, okay, what might be a reasonable accommodation um, based on your historic circumstances or your social identifier so that you can actually have a reasonable chance of succeeding in the job? And that's the difference between equality and equity. I love that. Great. Yeah. And it's not a guaranteed outcome. It's access to opportunity. And, Correct. And then yeah. I get to do with that opportunity whatever I want. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and that's on me at that point in time. And it's exactly. not on the system. The uh, the other thing here, and I want to kind of close with this because I think uh, you're you know, just an exemplar of this in, uh, in a very specific way here. You talked about delivering you know, DEIB you know, as an example here on a trash can or on a silver platter. Mm. The metaphor here has to do with storytelling. Yeah. And I know that that's one area that you absolutely excel in. Um, uh, 
Can you talk a little bit about how you actually weave storytelling into the work that you do with the clients and why it would be important for a leader you know, at any level in the organization? I'm not talking about titled leader, but mm -hmm. a leader that's causing movement to learn how to use stories effectively. Yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite topics. I actually teach storytelling for leaders um, when I'm teaching my master's course. And we know from neuroscience that stories have a way of reaching people in ways that statistics and dry data just don't. Because what we know is that people have these receptors in their brain that allow them to empathize and to connect. And so when a person hears a story that resonates with them um, or hears someone's raw emotion, uh, which we can all tap into, yep. and then it creates the level of, you know, um, either serotonin or oxytocin, it creates an emotional response that makes it easier to connect and understand why this is important as opposed to just reading uh, a pie chart or seeing a graph or seeing um, data points on a screen or on a PowerPoint. What it really tells you when people share this story is they're sharing with you their lived experience and they're helping to make it real in ways that data will not. So when a person tells you, for example, I've been working at this company for 20 years, but I've never once had the CEO acknowledge me or to uh, say my name, or I've worked in a team and I've never had people really ask me any questions about my personal life. That helps to make it more real for people. And it helps people to start to understand the real world consequences. What stories do additionally, is they allow people to see themselves in another person's experience. So when a person is talking, for example, about the joy, the pain, the struggle, the aspirations, the triumph, the hope, the disappointment that they've had, it allows me to connect in a way so that I can start to understand and empathize. That's really what it comes down to. Brain, bridging experiences, as one of my mentors said to me, the shortest distance between two people is a story. And mm -hmm. stories help to do that. Stories help to bring us together. And so when we're talking about DEIB, we, it's important to make sure that the people who are affected and the people we're trying to support, which is everybody, but the people we're trying to bring along, that they have names, that they have faces, that we give context and contour to their lived experiences so that these aren't people that we can just dismiss or overlook or say, I don't know who they are. I don't know why they're important. Now it becomes real. So now when a person says, I don't necessarily know if I support equity, are you saying that you don't support Rick, who for whatever reason, let's say Rick is a person who's had um, a learning disability? Or am I saying that I don't support Mary, who let's say is transgender? Or am I saying that I don't support another person? Then it becomes harder because these are the people who you actually see and work with and interact with on a day to day basis. These are not just people who you can overlook. These are the real people who you are part of a community with. And that's the part that's really important. So I would really encourage leaders to really refine, work with a coach, um, practice the story and be clear about your own story in it. Um, mm -hmm. Be clear as to why this is important to you, why you have why you have skin in the game that can move mountains that can help dissolve any tension. And more importantly, that helps to really counteract and wash over any biases and resistance that people have when people realize that this is a really a human movement. This isn't just some political trend that they're witnessing. Love it. Love it. Joel, thank you very much. Folks, we've been listening to Dr. Joel Davis Brown. Uh, where can people find out more about what you're up to? What would be uh, social uh, website, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I would, I tend to shy away from social media, but I would say definitely okay. joeldavisbrown.com. Um, you can also go to numos.com. That's P N E U M O S. It's a Greek word. Um, that's our, um, consulting website and yep. reach out to me on social media. I like to engage and talk and have conversations. So I always look forward to making new friends. Great. And I'll put those in the show notes so that, uh, when people click on this to listen, they'll, they'll, They'll see it right away. Okay. Excellent. Been a pleasure. Great. Hey, this has been great. I've uh, loved this conversation. Thanks for making the time. Folks, you've been listening to The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. And as always, find ways in your life to be a center of distribution, not a center of accumulation. You're going to find the world in your life works a whole lot better as a consequence. Take care, and I'll see you on the next episode.